The process of speech production that we've been studying requires coordinating all of the different muscles for respiration, phonation, and uh, articulation resonation that we've been studying in this class. That speech articulation occurs within a larger scope of speech production activity that involves planning what you want to say in addition to spelling out how you're going to say it, where you go from having some sort of idea or concept you want to express, have that expressed in terms of a group of phrases or sentences, each composed of individual words, those individual words each have phonemes or speech sounds within them, and then to produce those speech sounds we have the gestures of our articulators. This cascade of speech production processes is often talked about in the context of speech communication more generally uh, using the speech chain. This image shows you one example of the speech chain taken from a book um, with the title of the speech chain that's actually a pretty good layperson's introduction to speech production and speech perception. So if you were looking, for example, for something for your parents to read to help them understand what you've been studying in your classes, the speech chain is a pretty good book for that. Going through the chain of processes that are involved in speech communication starts with the speaker uh, using their brain to generate some sort of linguistic message that they want to convey. That linguistic message gets converted into um, a variety of physiological activities, uh, most of which we're talking about in this class in terms of speech articulation. That speech articulation results in a sound being generated, and so acoustics are involved. Those sound waves then get heard by the listener, as well as monitored by the speaker in terms of feedback. When the listener uh, hears the speech sounds and watches the speech articulation happen with their eyes, once again information is being converted back into a physiological um, representation. And then that sensory information from the ears and eyes uh, gets transmitted to the brain and recoded into that linguistic level message that is being conveyed. So overall, our production of speech involves the entire vocal tract, everything from the lips and nose uh, at the interface to the outside world, down to the larynx, as well as coordination with respiration to provide airflow to create speech sounds. Within the vocal tract itself, we have the coordination of a variety of articulators, the larynx determining whether or not there is phonation, the velum controlling whether air flows out through the oral cavity or the nasal cavity or both, and then all of the different speech articulators uh, that are part of chapter 6, um, shaping the oral cavity to create speech sounds. This process of speech production is known to be very flexible, and that's part of what makes uh, studying speech very challenging. So depending on the speaking situation, people vary their rate of speech, their loudness of their speech, how casually or carefully they are articulating things. So for example, when I'm being a uh, Mr. Professor in lecture mode, I'm trying to keep my rate relatively down, uh, try and have my loudness be adequate for people to hear me, and have the carefulness of my articulation be relatively high so that I'm easy to understand. In addition to these global changes to speech production, we also have uh, smaller changes to individual speech sounds based on their context. Uh, so a sound like a t sound can actually come out in a variety of different ways depending on the word. So in a word like top, it's aspirated. In a word like party, it's flapped. It might even sound a little more like a D to you. In a word like pot, it can be unreleased, so there's no t part to that T. In something like botany, you can release that T directly into a nasal so that the um, released air goes out through the nasal cavity. In something like bottle, you can similarly release that T only on the sides and not in the middle leading into that L. The location of the T can be altered a little bit, so in something like eighth, you generally have the T articulation be more forward behind the teeth. And finally, in something like painting, a casual production of the word painting, for example, uh, you may not uh, release that T uh, at all around those nasals, um, but there's an effect uh, in the larynx to represent the T being there. So when you say painting, there's a little bit of an mm hitch uh, to the voice 
called glottalization um, that represents the T sound in that case. We also know that even uh, quote unquote normal productions of speech sounds can vary between different speakers. Uh, so for example, the S sound can be produced with the tongue tip um, curled upward or with the tongue tip downward and the body of the tongue being used to produce the sound. Um, there are different versions of the ER sound involving bunching the tongue body or retroflexing the tongue tip, uh, which involves raising the tongue tip up so that the underside of the tongue is actually near the roof of the mouth. And then everyone is physiologically a little bit different. Um, I'm fairly large, uh, so I've got a bigger head than most people. That's going to have an effect on how I produce speech sounds and what the actual acoustics of the sound is going to be. Given all of this variability in speech sounds in production, it must also be the case then that speech perception is very flexible. We have all of this variability in speech sounds, but still hear the same sound in some sense or another, like all those different examples of T sounds. We can understand the speech produced by men, women, and children who are generally of different sizes, and so we're going to have different acoustics in their speech. Uh, we're also pretty good at understanding speech in a background of noise, even if the noise is louder than the speech. Um, so even without very clear speech cues, you can still generally understand what someone is saying, and so the speech perception system must be able to uh, accommodate all of these differences. Since the focus of this class is anatomy and physiology, we primarily look at articulation. Uh, the best way to describe how articulation works is in terms of articulatory goals, which are generally um, descriptions of types of articulations that are not specific as to what muscles are going to be used uh, or exactly how much. Um, so for example, experiments have been done on speech production that uh, affect what articulators you're allowed to use. And those experiments have shown that uh, our speech production is automatically uh, adapted to utilize whatever articulators are available. So we're not rigidly stuck with certain um, muscles or speech articulators um, being able to make a speech sound. Uh, instead, we have a, a general command like make a closure at the alveolar ridge, and the articulatory system will use a variety of muscular actions to make that goal happen depending on uh, the current configuration of the articulators. One of the fancier examples of studying articulatory goals is shown on this slide. This is a figure out of a research article uh, which did a quote-unquote bite block experiment um, where through the apparatus on the research participant's head, uh, the researchers had control of uh, basically a robotic arm that could make it more difficult for them to be able to open it and close their jaw. Um, if you uh, unexpectedly make it more difficult for a person to move their jaw, for example, um, by uh, increasing the load on the jaw through that robotic arm, other articulators like the tongue or the lower lip will make extra effort to make the appropriate speech gestures anyway, uh, despite the inability to move the jaw very well. Um, this happens automatically during speech production fairly quickly, um, so this gives us an idea that speech articulation is flexible in how articulatory goals are reached, um, and also that we monitor our own speech um, and have feedback that helps us adjust how we produce our speech to make sure we're coming out with the right speech sounds. So then if we were going to try to succinctly sum up all of this information about the flexibility of the speech production system uh, in terms of a question, I have three statements here, uh, one of which provides the best description. If you want to read each answer and think about it for a second, you can pause the video um, and come up with your own answer first. Answer number one is that the coordination of speech articulators is so complex that the articulators can only move through a limited set of memorized gestures. This could be one way speech production could happen, um, but in fact we don't have a limited set of me memorized gestures. Uh, we have an adaptable system that can um, create 
speech sounds meet our speech articulation goals um, using uh, a potentially unlimited set of different combination of things depending on the context. The second statement is that the coordination of speech articulators is so complex that the production of each phoneme only involves one articulator. Once again, um, we have more complicated things going on than that, and the system can handle it so we don't have our speech sounds distilled down to just one articulator doing things. We have uh, a particular articulatory goal we want to meet, but whether that goal gets met by the jaw or the lower lip or the tongue, uh, etc., is going to depend a little bit on context. So if we've knocked out answers one and two, then the third one must be correct. So we have a uh, coordination of speech articulators that's very complex. A phoneme's production can be achieved by many different combinations of articulators, and exactly how we do that depends on the context at the time while we're producing speech. A slightly more straightforward question about the context articulatory goals uh, would be which of these four statements is a decent example of what an articulatory goal represents. Statement number one says raise the lower lip five millimeters. This seems like it might be an okay articulatory goal because it's a little vague about how exactly they're doing things, but it's awfully precise about the amount of distance that needs to be moved and in actual speech production how far you might need to move the lower lip um, to make a, a speech sound like a buh is going to depend on like what the jaw is. If the jaw is very open from producing an ah vowel, you'll have to move that lower lip more. If the jaw is pretty closed from producing an e vowel, you would have to move that lower lip neck less to get to the next speech sound. Second statement, make a narrow constriction between the lower teeth and the upper lip. I believe this is the best answer we have. It has kind of a, a, a just the right amount of vagueness to it. We want a narrow constriction. We're saying what's going to make that narrow constriction and where, but we're not providing any more details on exactly how that's going to happen. Answer number three, contract the posterior genioglossus, is too specific in terms of the muscle that's going to be involved in making that speech sound. Answer number four, curl the tongue tip up, is actually probably your second best answer. It's a decent articulatory goal, um, but the purpose of doing that tongue tip curling isn't indicated. There's no location that that is supposed to be curled toward, or no indication of degree for how much uh, do we want to curl that up to uh, actually touch something and make a closure, or do we just want a narrow constriction? Uh, what are we trying to do? So that's kind of half of an articulatory goal. When we take the other side of articulation and look at resonation, how that articulatory movement makes a speech sound, uh, we have our source filter theory that says as we move our articulators around, we change the shape of the resonating cavity for our sound source, whether it's phonation or some sort of uh, noise made by oral constriction using our various articulators, the velum, the mandible, the lips, and the tongue that were part of our uh, chapter 6 work. These ideas have been uh, put together in an articulatory and acoustic model of speech called the DIVA model, um, where researchers have attempted not just to figure out how the speech sounds work, but also which parts of the neurological system are uh, in control. So we have a feed-forward system, which is basically the commands for making your speech articulations, and then we have a bunch of feedback systems where you're monitoring your articulations um, to make sure you're producing the right movement as well as the right acoustic result. You do not need to know all of these details. Uh, I just wanted to give you an example of how we might put it all together.